We're continuing with the transition into the Play It Loud era with Nintendo Power number 69 for February of 1995. The future version of the Blue Bomber is on the cover of this issue with Mega Man X2, and this cover is generally more readable than the last, though there is still some text obscured by the art. We get more letters to this issue, along with the request that they bring back comics, and the editorial staff is thinking about it. This time, our cover game is coming right out of the gate with Mega Man X2. The article gives weapons vulnerabilities, and also sets up a couple of recommended boss routes um, because of this. However, the maps we get for each of the Robot Masters also highlight what levels have areas that can only be accessed through um, certain weapons to unlock those paths to upgrades. So it, in a way, it kind of narrows down the boss order there further. So, I'm somewhat embarrassed to say that I was not able to get Mega Man X2 to work on my emulation software, and I don't own a copy of the latest Mega Man X collection. I own the PS2 Mega Man X collection, but it has some issues that makes it a yet less than useful alternative for purposes of this show. Next is Pieces, which is a competitive jigsaw puzzle game and has nothing to do with the horror movie from the 1970s. The game has a time limit, along with power-ups and some information on the different game modes. One like uh, one game mode, which mixes in uh, fake pieces with the regular ones. Pieces is an interesting puzzle game, but it also feels like one that would play better either in two-player or with a mouse instead of a controller. It always felt to me like the controls of the game using the uh, controller were a little more sluggish than the movements of the AI opponent on normal. I didn't think the game was fun, and I that the concept is novel and engaging, it's just a game that I think would also work better either with a mouse or on a PC. The first of the two Kirby games we have this issue is Kirby's Dream Course, which is described as something of a mix of golf and pool with some power-ups. We get maps of the first eight holes. I describe Kirby's Dream Course as being closer to miniature golf with a few funky tweaks to it, like having to hit a certain number of targets before hitting the hole. It's a lot more difficult than it seems at first glance, and definitely calls for a lot of thought in terms of both how you're gonna approach the hole and how the game's physics work. Um, like it's a it's a Kirby game that involves physics, and that says a lot right there. If you get a chance, check out the episode of Game Center CX where Arino you know, plays this game. It's um, definitely worth worth checking out as you kind of you get to see the entire playthrough of the game and how you approach some of the problems in there, and that sort of thing. Our other Kirby title this issue is Kirby's Avalanche, a reskin of a Puyo Puyo game the same way that Doctor's, Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine was on the Sega Genesis. The article has notes on some of the different gameplay modes. Gameplay-wise, Kirby's Avalanche has less of a learning curve and more of a learning cliff. The first level is pretty easy to clear, and then the difficulty escalates extremely quickly, to the point where I had extreme difficulty clearing the second level. This is actually a problem as to Western audiences, this is probably their first exposure to the Puyo Puyo series and that style of gameplay, unless you owned both a Super Nintendo and a Sega Genesis. We have the second half of our Lion King guide, which covers the trans transition to Adult Simba. The article also has a sidebar on how they did the game's fluid animations, which was basically by just directly digitizing animation cells from the movie with characters' movement cycles and using that to create the uh, character sprites. The Lion King plays interestingly. The controls are fine, and the levels are interestingly designed, and I like the concept of your character transitioning from depowered cub Simba to adult Simba. And I also felt, unlike some games, the fluidity of the animations never got in the way of being able to navigate the level. At no point did I feel like I was in a position where, as a player, the animation locked me into an action that I didn't want to perform. It's definitely a strong game in a lot of respects, and probably one of the best Disney film adaptations. Next up is a guide for Super Punch-Out, which I've already covered, so we're just going to move on. We have a sports scene called This Issue, and... We have to talk. Look, we've got a ton of sports games this issue, and there's not a lot to say about most of them. At this point in video games, uh, 
hockey, baseball, or football game are pretty much fine, or they just suck. They don't have a story, they don't have a lot of diversity in level environments, and they don't necessarily have an upgrade path. It's the same thing with racing games, particularly since we don't have, because, because of the limitations of this console, you don't have a lot of freedom of options when it comes to level environments. Like, there's a reason why some of the first launch titles were for, like, the PlayStation, were, and the Saturn, for that matter, were racing games. Because, yes, some certainly, like, the, the Saturn version of... Well, uh, Daytona may have had a few issues with frame rate in some areas. It still looked better. There was more diversity of environments than some of these games here. Yes, there are less tracks, but there, there's more to it than a flat plane. And that's kind of what's frustrating when it comes to reviewing these games. Is it a lot of these games get kind of monotonous. And it makes it hard for me to w want to keep going through these games. And not just put it another way is, I now understand why Dr. Sparkle got so very burned out about constantly reviewing baseball games on the on Crontendo. Because there are s so little to say about most of these games. They're the games that fill up bargain bins at video game show stores and retro gaming conventions and pad out bulk lots on eBay. Not because they're bad games and somebody's desperately trying to get rid of them, but because they're just okay. Like, part of the reason the failure of NBA Live on modern consoles, or rather the last generation, the Xbox 360 and PS3, got so much airtime is because it wasn't just a failure, it was a spectacular visual failure where you could point at it and see the characters in T-poses and have something to talk about. Not other than the new NBA Live is out, here's the things they changed, it plays well to playing okay. It's either it's not an improvement on the previous game or it's a slight improvement in certain respects. That said, there is something I can say about the wrestling games we get this issue, so I'm going to talk about those. WWF Raw is a game that feels like it has a major difficulty spike compared to WWF Super WrestleMania, the previous game made with the same engine. The Super WrestleMania I felt like I was able to pull off moves for the characters and did generally okay up to a point. However, WF Raw seems to have had the um, CPU inputs designed from the assumption that everyone playing the game was playing with the Turbo Controller. Admittedly, companies have been putting out all variety of uh, third-party controllers with turbo chargers by this point, so I completely understand why they operate with that assumption. But still... If you're not playing with Turbo, it's immensely frustrating. It felt like I was completely unable to do any sort of grapple move in the game, which is a royal pain in the neck. Still, it does bear mentioning that with the inclusion of Luna Vachon in the roster, we have the first wrestling game to have a woman as a playable character in the game, the first wrestling game where a woman can have matches with men, and the first wrestling game where a woman could technically win the WWF Heavyweight title. WCW Super Brawl, the other wrestling game we have this issue, is a pretty terrible wrestling game. It's a wrestling game where I can't tell how the grappling animations work, or don't work, and I can't tell how, when I, how to land moves. I don't, know if it's, I don't know if I need to be doing timing, I don't even need to be do button mashing, I just can't tell what I need to succeed. For all the faults that the SmackDown games have had over the years, they are generally good about 
communicating basic information about how to play the game. Same thing with the Fire Pro games and how and the deliberate way their animations work. This game does not do that. This isn't helped by the incredibly fast pinfall counts that happen when you're pinned. I had one instance where I had more health and strength than an opponent, but he pinned me, and in spite of my mashing the hell out of the controller in order to break, the, break out of the pin, I still got pinned anyway. It's, it's a frustrating mess. I can't recommend this game, which is a bummer, because this is a really nice era of WCW, and seeing these characters, seeing these wrestlers represented in video game form has appealed to me. There are reasons why I like I would like to be able to play as Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, or the Steiner Brothers, or that sort of thing, or Big Van Vader, and not being able to do that is, uh, or being able to having the game where you get to play as them be so very terrible is kind of a bummer. After that, we get a roundup of a whole bunch of upcoming titles using the Super FX chip. All of which save one get cancelled. And the only game of these four that comes out being uh, Dirt Tracks FX, which we may get to review in the future. In the classified information column, we get a 50 lives code for Donkey Kong Country. Next up on the games we'll be covering is Wolverine Adamantium Rage! Sorry. The guide is notes and Wolverine moves, along with the walking time limit of LCD, a robot semi-ally of Wolverine created by the Ravengers in an attempt to kill him, which ends up backfiring on them. We get maps of some of the early stages of the game. Apparently, Shinobi Shaw of the Upstarts is one of the early bosses. Hmm. Wolverine Adamantium Rage is kind of a mess. While you don't lose health for popping your claws like some other X-Men games, the animation for your attacks is an issue. For example, I found it could be difficult to launch jump attacks against enemies, which is a problem, as the first level has a whole bunch of enemies who you have to land a bunch of jump attacks on in order to proceed. It feels like the game designers have some good ideas on the general structure of the game, but just utterly failed when it came to executing these concepts from a mechanical standpoint. Man, I wish there were more good X-Men games. Clay Fighter did well enough to get a sequel with Clay Fighter 2 Judgment Clay. Topical humor! We get five new characters, but we don't get their moves. Clay Fighter 2 feels graphically underwhelming compared to the first game. The character sprites feel flat without the sense of depth that the digitized images of you know the clay models had in the in the first game. This also leads to some fairly underwhelming attack animations as I never got a good grasp of how much reach the characters that I was controlling had. And on top of that, the level designs, while more animated and more clearly digitized clay dioramas, again, with movement to the backgrounds like Street Fighter 2 and that sort of thing, uh, end up feeling cluttered. And in some cases, they actively interfere with being able to judge some of the action, which is a major no-no in any game. In Counselor's Corner, we get lots of RPG questions about Final Fantasy III and other similar RPGs. Next is Sequest DSV, another licensed game based on a science fiction TV show. It looks like the hub overworld of the game is done in the style of the Strike games, while the main levels are horizontal shoot 'em ups. My description of how you play Sequest DSV is mostly correct, with one minor correction, well, major correction. When you meet, reach a mission area, you have to launch your subs to carry out the mission, and the game doesn't tell you how to launch the subs. Also, there are no FAQs for this game. Also, there are no scans of the manual for the Super Nintendo version of this game. Game Boy? Yes. Super Nintendo? No. Which means that unless you picked up a copy of this game with the manual, you, the game cannot be completed. Or you are unless you're really, really lucky at guessing the controls, which, which I'm not. Oh, controls and menu interface. Next is Tiny Toon Adventures Wacky Sports Challenge, a track and field esque collection of mini games. Well, and it's a track and field style collection of mini games, helped by the fact that it's by Konami, the people who developed track and field. So there's a lot of focus on button mashing, 
with some more rhythmic elements and some timing elements, but otherwise with the levels not necessarily having much finesse. Some, but not necessarily a lot. Moving into Game Boy titles, we have Donkey Kong Land, which is like Donkey Kong Country, except it's on the Game Boy, and has a bunch of new levels while still having sprites and environments based on polygonal models. I will give credit where credit is due for Donkey Kong Land. The music is adapted to the Game Boy hardware incredibly well, and the game has save points at the end of every level, which is ideal for if you are adapting, if you are taking a game like Donkey Kong Country and adapting it to a portable format where it's going to be played in smaller chunks that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do sitting down with the television. Additionally, the sprite and camera perspective are scaled perfectly for the size of the screen. Um, you can see just far enough ahead to handle most of the challenges that, you're, that you face. The sprites have their full range of expressiveness and full fluidity of their animation. That part, they nail. However, the use of polygonal models, both for character sprites and background elements, on a monochrome screen, makes for graphics that are a goddamn mess. This game looks terrible. It is incredibly hard to, in, re in frequent cases, spot the edges of platforms and level environments, and enemy enemies which are not camouflaged in the original game end up being camouflaged by the level environments here. Like seriously, Donkey Kong Country did a tremendous job of using color to make sure that enemies were always visible in level environments. If an enemy was on screen, you could tell where they were. Here, it is not the case, and it hinders the game tremendously. Speaking of Super Nintendo ports, we have a portable version of Desert Strike, with notes on the first level, and I'll add that the map behind the text here uh, hinders the readability in spots. The Game Boy version of Desert Strike almost pulls it off. The controls work fairly well, and the game does a different, decent job of shifting the camera to help you navigate. But the problem is the game doesn't do a good job of communicating the current state of your ammo, health, and fuel reserves, so you don't know when you need to go looking for one of the pickups that you found earlier until it's a little too late. I appreciate the work that was put into making this game. Um, it was It's definitely a novel idea of porting this particular title, and it almost works. But I think that Game Boy ports of Super Nintendo games don't quite cut it. In the power charts, uh, Street Fighter 2 is completely out of the top 20, while Mortal Kombat 2 remains. Also, Star Fox 2, which technically doesn't get a release until a few years ago with the Super Nintendo Mini, um, has also entered the charts. In the now-playing column of note here is Sunsoft's version of the Mario Paint Suite with Acme Animation Factory. Finally, in the Pack Watch column, we get info on Star Fox 2, along with Stargate, and the eventually cancelled game Fireteam Rogue. Konami and LucasArts also have Metal Warriors, a mecha action game inspired by anime. And there's also some initial discussion of GoldenEye, as a game for the Super Nintendo, instead of the later first-person shooter we get for the N64. But what steals the show from all of this, even from gold, from our first murmurings of GoldenEye, is the impending release in the United States of Mother 2, a.k.a. Earthbound. My pick of this issue is Kirby's Dream Course. It's a difficult game for me to really succeed at, it's a game where failure can clearly snowball fairly rapidly. However, it's a game, like with a good golf uh, compu computer or video game, where I feel like my failures are clearly through my own actions, and thus I can figure out what I need to do to succeed. Not only that, but learning the answers to those questions helps me improve at the game overall, instead of helping to overcome a single challenge.
Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like sub and subscribe and click the little bell button to be notified whenever new episodes show up on my channel. If you really like the show, please consider backing it on Patreon. Backers will get their name in the credits and at higher levels you get episodes up to one week early and at even higher levels you can select what games that I do for my future Let's Plays. You can find my Patreon at patreon.com slash count zero O-R. <laughs>